want to thank you for coming today. Uh, there is a jazz concert at four, if you can stick around. Uh, there's some very good musicians. Uh, I've heard, come on in. And uh, so before, I do want to introduce Bill Batson, who is really lovely that he's come today. He's an artist and a writer and an activist. Uh, he's worked for nonprofits, labor unions, government in New York State as an organizer and a writer and public relations specialist. And I, I want to start, because Bill's talking about two fathers, two continents, I wanted to kind of use a, a quote just because this is African American History Month. And I'm always very interested in, I've been very interested in Frederick Douglass, especially the last speeches. Come on, sit down. You can't stay? It doesn't matter. Half the students are going to try to leave when they can or sneak out, but uh, it doesn't matter. You've got to sign in, though. She's taking, we, we have to have people sign in or we don't get credit that you've come. So it's important that you've signed. Uh, whether you're a student or not a student, it's important that you say you've signed in. Sorry. <clears throat> but uh, I like this last speech of Douglas because the older Douglas got, he didn't get less radical, he got more radical. So in his last great speech was called Lessons of, Lessons of the Hour, which if you haven't read it, it's pretty good, especially in these times. And I always like to think of this quote because it seems to me when you're looking for your father or your mother, in terms of finding out who they were and where they came from. You have to think about home, and what it means to have a home, because it seems to me a mom and a dad are part of the home. And uh, I think what Douglas said in, towards the end of his life, which I'll quote, uh, I actually have it on a billboard in my office. Um, Every man who thinks at all must know that home is the fountainhead, the inspiration, the foundation and main support not only of all social virtue but of all motives to human progress and that no people can prosper or amount to much without a home. To have a home, African Americans must first have a country. And I think that struggle for a home and a country is still being waged here in America. And so I just want to say that because it is African American History Month and the only events we're having this year are is Bill Batson and our jazz concert today, which is traditional. We always have a jazz concert in, in February because jazz is uniquely African-American and American thing. So please welcome Bill Batson. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McCarthy. Um, Frederick Douglass is actually how we met. I was in possession of a complete collection of the writings of Frederick Douglass, and Professor was doing a exhibit about Douglass at, I think, Maria Luisa's. Yes. So he borrowed my Philip Foner, five volume. Um, hearing the name Frederick Douglass reminds me of my favorite quote, and I think it's a very appropriate quote for today on college campuses and high schools around the country. He said, and I'm going to try to get this right, power yields nothing without a demand. It never did. It never will. And then he said, those who profess freedom yet deprecate agitation want crops without plowing up the ground. That, those are the words of a person who was born into a world where it was illegal for him to read or write. He became a scholar against those odds. So those of us who have scholarship that we were granted without those difficulties, I think have an even higher burden. So I'm um, here to speak about my two fathers on two continents. I'm not even quite sure how we came up with that theme. I do have two fathers on two continents. Um, I'm reminded of, uh, there's a Nat King Cole documentary that my mother who's here and I watch all the time um, on Netflix because we love the music. And uh, Tony Bennett in this documentary describes jazz as elongated improvisation. And that right there is a, a very powerful art form. Just to take an improvisation and to keep it going. So that's kind of what I've done here through the slides I'm about to show you. The slides, um, I can talk a little bit about some of my writing, um, but the slides kind of tend to be more about my artwork 
Um, uh, you'll see that my one father is represented extensively, my other father not so much, and, and you'll understand and you'll see why. Um, and just for my own purposes, I'm looking for a timer. What, what's the, uh, when do we stop? So, okay, so I'll stop at around 3.15, three times. I'll, ch I'll see. Um, so um, th this story is as much about um, adoption and self-discovery as it is these two uh, men who, um, who factor into my life. I'll, I'll just start with a, a revelation that I had today. I'm teaching a class on, on memoir making and um, uh, some of these great names that we're throwing out here. There's another uh, incredible scholar, American scholar, um, African-American scholar, W.E.B. W. Du Bois, who was around at the founding of, of um, social studies and that, or, or yeah, the, 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 the academic um, 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 body of, of social studies and um, or, or sociology actually. And um, he found it um, uh, he found it necessary to pen three autobiographies in the course of his life. He wrote one when, when, when he was 30, and the symmetry of this guy's brain is incredible. One when he was 60, and one when he was 90. <laughs> and um, I figure that there's some people on this planet who, at 15 years of age, unfortunately, have a story to tell that would blow your mind. So I don't think you should think of memoir writing as something that you know accomplished, distinguished people do at the end. It's a good thing the unexamined life is not worth living. So it's always appropriate, I think, to to reflect on your life and write. So I'm doing this memoir class, and one of the exercises involved, um, you know, discussing something that you would say about yourself. And I always like to tell people that. Um, I'm um, from the labor movement. And for a period of my life, I worked um, for labor unions. I was involved in demonstrations. I'm going to show you some of that. But what, what I learned, what, what I realized today is that my father was in the labor movement. So when I'm saying I'm in the labor movement, I'm really honoring my father. Because when I was a kid, my father was a United Auto Worker. And they would go on strike. They used to have these things called strikes. And labor would try to get more money. And um, he worked in Lodi, New Jersey. And you know we were doing pretty good. We were middle class. But I think some of his colleagues at this, on the strikes would struggle. So when we would go to the labor, when we go to the picket line, he would always stop at the grocery store first. And I was always kind of like, why are we shopping? We're going out. We're not coming home. We're going someplace. And he goes, no, no, no. I got to go shopping. And he'd buy bags and bags of groceries. And he would drop it off at the union hall for his brothers and sisters on the picket line who didn't have food. So that always, I, I thought that was an amazing gesture. But then I said this is about adoption and discovery. So you know, I don't know if they've done a lot of research about adoption and biological imperative, but later in life I learned that my, so I was adopted and my adopted father was on the picket line. My biological father was one of the founders of the Kenyan labor movement. And I later had a job at a union that was his home whenever he would come to the United States. So there, there are interesting threads that you can pick apart and, 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 and perceive if you start to examine you know, the, the fabric of, of, of your life. So I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit through some slides. So right now, um, I, um, I primarily am a columnist on a website called Nyack News and Views. It's, the work that's closest to my heart, I publish a, a, a short uh, essay and sketch once a week. Um, on, on, in a good month, there are a good number of original ones. I, I have created over 250, almost 300 over the last um, uh, uh, seven years, so sometimes I do repeats. This is one that I wrote very recently about an exhibit that is up until, I believe, the... Um, 25th at the um, Hopper House by an artist named Carrie Mae Weems. She went to Beacon, New York and did oral histories and collected those oral histories and used them for her artwork. This incredible photographer. But we in Nyack created a community 
component to her exhibit here, and we collected oral histories, and it was incredible to have an opportunity. Um, I like to remind people that you know um, nobody um, would ever throw out. Would you ever throw out your cell phone without downloading the memory first? <laughs> if you're going to buy a new one, would you just like throw it out? No. It, it would. If somebody took it from you, you would feel robbed. Um, all that uh, data and all those m numbers and all those photographs are precious. But yet we let people in our families go to sleep every year without downloading their memories, without spending time asking, what was it like in the 60s? What was it like when you moved to Rockland? What was it like in the old country? What was it like being an immigrant? What was it like being a worker? What was it like being a parent or a teacher? All this information would be valuable. Later in life, you're going to say, wow, I wish I had it. But we don't do that. So we started on Martin Luther King's birthday to collect oral histories in Nyack as part of this project. And it's something I hope to do more and more. There's um, a woman who I'll hope to rem rem I hope to um, allude to later in my presentation. But her name is Wengari Mathai. And she is uh, part of this thing in Kenya called, well, she was. She passed. She was a Nobel laureate. And she created this thing called the Green Belt Movement. And um, their intention was to plant trees. And that was what they did. And that simple act was very radical in terms of the impact on the environment and the impact on communities and the impact on, on um, uh, erosion prevention. Um, so she started with, I think, a goal of a million trees. And because of her hundreds of millions of trees and soon billions of trees would have been planted, well, I'd like to be the Wingari Mathai of oral histories. I think that everyone should leave behind a document, a record of their, their life on, on the planet. Um, but this is my life on the planet. So I was a labor organizer. It's funny, the first slide. Um, when I'm introducing myself, this is the first slide I pick. And that is the union that I worked for, 1199. And though that line of people always in the front of the march are the elected officials that come to be on the front of the march because that's the best place to get your picture taken for the newspaper. Um, I would do uh, political organizing. Uh, I would help organize rallies and demonstrations. Um, this was a giant demonstration at the um, uh, uh, tip of Manhattan. I think that's like what 15 to 20,000 people looks like. Um, I was the uh, uh, press person, so I would deal with reporters and try to get the right image of the crowds. This is the day that David Dinkins discovered that he would be the 106th mayor of New York and the first African mayor, African American mayor of New York. Um, that's me to the, in the lower left-hand corner, looking up at the camera. Um, uh, there, I was doing voter registration. That was always something I thought that was really, really important. And if every single person who was upset about what happened. In, in the high school in Florida registered and voted in the midterm elections, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We'd be on to the next important issue. Um, it's the lack of participation that is allowing this to happen. I mean, certainly it's bad decisions in Congress, but it's our Congress. We either elected them by default or on purpose, so we can unelect them on purpose if we choose. I worked on uh, the Hil campaign of Hillary Clinton in 2000. But I was really most interested in the parts of um, activism that involved education. So this was a project called the uh, uh, Hip Hop Highways into the Past, History, Organizing, and Power. We would take uh, students down south to learn about the um, Southern Civil Rights Movement. Um, this is the Edmund Pettus Bridge where a group of um, uh, citizens attempted to march across the bridge to um, uh, protest the, the laws in Alabama, and they were attacked on national television with billy clubs by the police. It was called Bloody Sunday, and that event led to passage of um, significant legislation in the 60s. Um, what's going on now, I'll, I'll return to, is, is significant because in all mo major movements, the moment that critical mass is reached is when young people break from norms and step into the breach. Um, 
in, uh, in Soweto, South Africa in 1976. Students stopped, they refused to learn Afrikaans, the language of the um, Dutch, Dutch colonizers, and, and began to fight back. And that was the momentum that led to the election, the, the freeing of Mount Nelson Mandela and his election. And I'll talk a little bit about Mount Mandela later. Um, in, this, in the civil rights movement, it was young people in Birmingham the, the, the goal in Birmingham was to fill the jails, and they realized that, um, that they kept creating bigger jails. So they'd fill the real jail, so then they'd start jailing people in the high school, and then they'd fill the high school, so they'd start jailing people in the yards outside the high school in the football field. So all of a sudden, they went through the high school kids, they went through the middle school kids, and all the organizers were standing around. It was James Bevel and Martin Luther King, and they were like Andy Young, Hosea Williams, and they were like, there's no more people. James Orange was there, they said there's no more people. So a delegation of elementary school students, this really happened. Elementary school students came and said, we're ready, we'll do the march. And when the governor heard that there were gonna be elementary school students marching into fire hoses and dogs, which is how the police responded to those marches, the governor picked up the phone and called Lyndon Johnson and said, Sign it. Whatever you got to do, do. But this can't happen. So when young people step forward, things in societies tend to change rather quickly and dramatically. So I got to travel. I got to travel to South Africa in uh, 1994. I met, this was Nelson Mandela's um, cellmate, Walter Sizulu. Sizulu, Mandela, and Tambo are kind of like the you know, the, the Adams and the Jeffersons and the Washingtons of, of that country. And in our lifetime, they pulled off an incredible feat. They went from probably a pariah nation that was the most racist, uh, hostile nation to women and LGBTQ and black and immigrant. It was just, a, a, it, was a, it was a prison of a nation. And now it's probably one of the most free nations in the world, and they recently actually even overcame corruption, which is something that can happen to any government. So it's a phenomenal case study. If you're interested in a country, you want to learn more about a country, or even to visit a country, South Africa is phenomenal. And it's very similar to the United States. It was um, colonized by first the Dutch, then the Americans, had long periods of indigenous people living in reservations. Um, we had them here with Native Americans. Some argue we still do. So there's a lot of parallels between South Africa and the United States. I ran for public office in Brooklyn. And when you run for public office, two bad things can happen. You could lose or you could win. <laughs> um, so I um, am pleased that I <coughs> lost. Um, it was tough. It was a tough loss. It, Personal, on a personal level, but the, the class of people that I was going into office with, when I look at their fortunes and their directions and their misdirections, I'm quite pleased. So back to Nyack. So my family came to Nyack in, in the 1880s from Stamford, my father's fam side of the family, Prime, and his, his great grand his, his grandfather, my great-grandfather, George T. Avery. And he was one of the founding deacons of St. Philip's, Amy Zion Church, that's St. Philip's. So this is one of the drawings I do with my essays. So the angle's kind of pitched up because I sat on the curb and I drew. But I find that when I was a young person, I came to Nyack every weekend. And um, remember, Ma, coming up to Nyack? Yes, I and I think I like to draw from that angle because it's almost like you know, when you're a kid, everything is big and large. So I think I almost inadvertently try to create that, that, that angle. Um, so this is George T. So these are my drawings of, of, of my family. Um, he would be the gentleman with the young boy on his lap. And the woman right above him, the tall woman, was my grandmother, Frances Lillian Avery Batson. This is Frances Lee and Avery Batson, the woman hovering over my aunt Adeline Batson, who has a little bow in her hair, and the bald guy was my dad. My dad passed away in 1994. So um, I uh, 
have a lot of drawings of my, my parents. So for this, um, for his, uh, I'll say that later. So, um, so for this presentation, I went through and I just kind of pulled them out. I actually have an exhibit. If you go to the Carrie Mae Weems exhibit at the Hopper House, I have an exhibit of my, some of my drawings of my family's that's up for this month too. Um, this is, everybody know Memorial Park in Nyack? Anybody know it? So you know those, those stairs that go down? That's the, so the, there's a plaque up there to the World War, II, World War I veterans. So this is at the base of those steps. This is around 1932. So the guy, the tall guy to, to your left with the spectacles, that's George T. Avery. He was the head of the Boy Scout troop. And these are all black Boy Scouts. I don't know if it was officially segregated, but their troop was all black. This, is, this reminds me of anybody, I mean, I'm dating myself all over the place, but Little Rascals, anybody remember Little Rascals? Okay, th this is like my Little Rascal photo, because watch, they, they wore Argyle socks and knickers to play baseball. Like, they had the, like now, think about, we go to work in pajamas, and they wore like Sunday clothes <laughs> to play baseball. Different time. So this is a, a drawing of my father and one of his war buddies. So he grew up in Nyack and um, went on to uh, participate in the Second um, World War. He was in the Signal Corps. He experienced so much racism. And my dad was pretty conservative. I think he voted Democratic, but you know he, he would strike most people as a Republican in his views and outlooks. But he refused to allow me to consider the military. Like, it was as early as he could even articulate it. He's, I think he even told me once that if they try to draft you, I'll get you over the border. Mm. I mean, that's how poorly he was treated while he was carrying a gun and defending American democracy in World War II. He just would not have it, his son in the military. Which is kind of interesting, because if you hear Colin Powell speak, there have been a lot of strides in the military, and it's... Some people say there's, uh, there's more of a meritocracy now in the military for an African-American than there is in society as a whole because of just the demands of the organization that they're in. There, there, there's certain things that have to be measured, like talent and aptitude and skill, but my dad did not want me to be a soldier. So that's my father. In this, these are the line drawings that I do now more. I love... It's one of my favorite drawings. So this is him in Rome in 1945, hanging out. Mm -hmm. I think I found my way to this part. I think this is near the Pantheon. Um, when I was there, it kind of looked familiar. There are all these little cafes around the Pantheon. So that's mom. Yes. That's you. I don't know if I did you justice. You're certainly beautiful there. <laughs> Not as beautiful as here. That's me. I look like I'm up to something. <laughs> like, uh, and that's my dad. Stylish green and orange sweater. So this is dad uh, relaxing with a beverage. Um, my family name, I'm William Batson, but anybody here into comic books? So who is, Cal who is Captain Marvel's alter ego? There you go. So I grew up with that. And it was, there was a Saturday morning cartoon show. And, and, uh, and my fiance, her favorite show was Isis. And Isis came on, I don't know if it was after or before Captain Marvel, but um, those comics that you like as a child stay with you forever. Mm -hmm. So that's my dad. Oh, I did call him Grumpy Old Man, didn't I? Probably should have <laughs> cropped that one. <laughs> I think he was annoyed at me. That's him relaxing. So in his 90th year, I um, took on a project where I would uh, do a watercolor of him every morning. I wanted to learn more about watercoloring. And I was always very intimidated by it. So I figured if I just gave myself this task where I had to do it every day, so I picked a leap year at 366 of these watercolors I did. And I did them, you'll see, the, you'll see three of them. He's always looking down because he wouldn't really sit still. He was always very active. Um, so the only time I could get him to sit still was 
when he was eating his breakfast. So he particularly liked his breakfast, so I could get him to focus. So, so that's, uh, this is one. This was the first one I did. And you can actually see a little bit of progression. So this, is the, this was October 22nd, 2011. That was his birthday, his 90th birthday. And there we go in March, so I'm a little bit more comfortable with the brush. Doing details, I would zoom in and zoom out and zoom in and zoom out. I'd do ears for a month and I'd do noses for a month. And that's towards, this is probably the second to last one before the end of the year. And um, so my mom just turned 90 on February 1st. Happy birthday. She gets to be, it, it, when you're, you know, if you make 90 years, you get a whole birthday year. We're going to celebrate her 90th birthday till, till her 91st birthday. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so I'm every now, every morning drawing her hands. I'm uh, trying, hands are very tough to draw. So I'm working on hands. Um, so feet, <laughs> this is my father's foot. And, and in, in honor of this event today, you know, you keep things that your parents have. Barry and I were talking about it. Like when Barry's father passed, he took a pair of his shoes and wore them. For some weird reason, I ended up with a pair of my dad's gray socks. And you know how you always, um, you know, um, lose a sock? Like, it's impossible to keep a pair of socks. It's impossible for me to lose this pair of socks. <laughs> Not that I've tried, but they just stick around. So I'm wearing his sock and, and his bracelet today in his honor. So he uh, had, um, you know, difficulties in later life, like we all will. <laughs> um, this piece... Um, is actually my most viewed sketch log because I wrote about the Affordable Care Act. It had just been passed, so I did a drawing of him. I was in the hospital with him. When you have a loved one in the hospital, that's all you need to know. I had the whole Jimmy Kimmel moment. You, the whole absurdity of it is just so clear because all you want is a simple way to help them, and you're dealing with people making a lot of money Dozens of them, and sometimes it seems like they can't do the simplest thing or like the most trivial thing costs $800. And it just, you can tell the, the system's out of whack when you engage it and you're trying to help somebody you care or love about. So I, I wrote about the health care um, uh, issue when, when my father was in the hospital. So this is the last picture of my mom and dad together. Mom, remember that picture? Mm. Janae took that picture. So, um, so he, he passed away on uh, the 14th of January in 2014? No, the 19th, 19th. And um, he had a beautiful, and as much as, it was a tough decision for me to invite the military because of I knew how he felt, but I also knew that he fought in a war and deserved to be honored. So they played taps, it was very moving. So my, my parents um, were, were ex extraordinary, great, great parents. I, I would never trade a minute of my childhood. Um, but they made an extraordinary decision when I was nine months old to adopt me. I was adopted. And in the manner I talked about my dad as conservative, he insisted that my mother not tell me that I was adopted. So I discovered when I was 30 that I was adopted. Um, I, I spent the day with a colleague, um, and, and uh, she was um, very observant. And when we got back to New York, she said, you know, I noticed that family resemblance is strongest in the hands, and your, your hands don't look like either of your parents' hands. Mm -hmm. And as random as that was, I stood up and I said, I'm adopted. And the thought, I don't think it ever crossed through my mental landscape, but immediately I was like, I know I'm adopted. I was adopted. So I picked up the phone, I called my dad, and I prefaced it. I said, this is the most important question I'm ever going to ask you, and I expect an honest reply. Mm -hmm. Was I or wasn't I adopted? And there was a long pause, and he said, ask your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well... I guess that's an honest reply. <laughs> so um, so I, I found out I was adopted, and then I went through the whole process that people who 
um, have a biological family that they're disconnected from go. You, you, you're curious, you want to know about you know, who they were, where they were, why they were, what they were, when they were, all those words. So I was at a party on, on a rooftop in the city and I mentioned that I was adopted and this guy just turns over and he goes, you want to find out who? I'm like, yeah? And he goes, I'm a private detective. <laughs> And I thought, oh, I don't have money. And he goes, no, 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 I'm not going to charge you. He goes, get your birth certificate. He said, everything on it can be a legal fiction. The name, the place you're born, the, everything can be made up except the birth certificate number. It's a, it's a, it's a live, live birth record. It's a real number, and it, and it coincides with a real record. So you take that number and you go to the real life birth sections of any library in that year and you search them and you'll find out who your birth parents were. And I was like, oh, okay, sounds easy. <laughs> the records are in these giant tomes, like bigger than any book in any library you've ever seen. There's no microfiche of them. They're not searchable. Maybe they are now, but in 1990... Eight, I think I did this. Yeah, they were, they, they, you had to go through it line by line. So it was like, I, I said it was like looking for a needle in a needle stack. <laughs> because you had to go through, so, so A through K was this one volume, and then K through Z was this volume. And my concern was that I wouldn't have the, um, um, I, I wouldn't have the, uh, um, uh, the, the mindfulness to, to, to stay present um, through the whole search so that I would like kind of pass over it. Mm -hmm. So that I would have the feeling when I was done that it wasn't there, but really I just lost concentration. So I was like totally Red Bull, you know, coffee, trying to stay focused. And it's, you know, and then I had, um, so I got some birth records. So um, I'm actually going to skip over some stuff. So um, th this was, so I found out, um, that I was adopted, I had the birth record, but I also found out, I don't, somehow I found out the adoption agency. I think my mother told me. My mother told me two things. She said, you were adopted by Spence Chapin, and that your birth name was Nigel. So I went to the adoption agency, Spence Chapin, and I used all of my political powers of persuasion, because adoption records are sealed. And you, can't not, you cannot pierce them. They will not give you any what's called identifying information because they don't want you to reverse engineer who you are. So I went after them in every way, nonviolently and politely, that I could. And I got a lot the first round. And um, it says here at the bottom, your birth father was a 26-year-old single black man from Kenya. He was a senior in college and was interested in politics. He was in good, oh, he was six foot three with large brown eyes and a dark complexion. He was in good health. Your birth father had one brother who held an important job, important government job. Mm -hmm. And I was in South Africa when I got this. So there was a story I was going to tell you about, like meet and Mandela. Um, so I was, I was, I found my way to South Africa and, um, I got this autograph from him. He, 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 Mandela liked to perform in plays on Robben Island. He liked Greek plays. And um, think about the quality of the leadership in that country. He, he, was, he, he, he In his spare time, he studied the classics and, um, while incarcerated. So, um, so I met Mandela, and I was living in South Africa. I was writing about it. This is an essay that I wrote. It was black and political color. And, um, all of a sudden, I'm in South Africa, and I find out my father was from Kenya. So I'm like, wow, that's just like a short flight away. It's 17 hours to get to, from New York to, to Cape Town. It's two hours, I think, to get from Cape Town to Nairobi. So I'm re really ready to go. So I went back at the adoption agency and pushed more and pushed more. Actually, this trip, I did go to Kenya. Um, and I basically <laughs> like walked around Nairobi saying, you know, <laughs> Can you help me find my father? <laughs> and people were like, who the heck? <laughs> like, 
Oh, man, Americans, you guys are so crazy. <laughs> what are you talking about? So, um, but I went back and I got more information. And this one confirmed that my name was Nigel. Oh, and it gave me, this was important too, it gave me the, the time of my birth. So now I had several data points. I had the birth certificate record number. I had my name. I had the time of my birth. So um, this was an article I wrote while I was there called Looking for a um, Father in the Motherland. And um, this is me in Kenya. This was the first trip. Um, and uh, it's incredible, you know, parts of Africa or any country where there's great poverty because, you know, we um, take so much for granted. And, you know, some of the most intelligent conversations I've ever had were with people who live in, like, just corrugated cardboard dwellings. Um, so this was, uh, I, I found, I was doing a lot of, this was that trip too. Um, there's a tradition in animist cultures that um, taking a, a photograph, uh, taking a picture of a person is considered a violation of their, their spirit, it's capturing the spirit in the camera. So people will, you know, either react very poorly to having their picture taken or charge you an exorbitant amount of money for the offense that you've, it's almost like a tax. Um, but the thing I like to do is draw. Drawing gets the exact opposite reaction. So this was a tribal elder in, in, in Kenya that I was drawing. So you can see that there's like a crowd beside him, some of them wanting to be the next person drawn. And then you can't see it, but there was a crowd behind me watching me draw. So it became like this community activity. So that, that was the drawing, Ole Supet, the Maasai Hotel. Um, so, so I did piece it all together, and I, um, uh, my godson was with me, and um, I got through the A's all the way to the H's, and I was looking for the name Nigel, and I found the name Nigel next to the name Havener, and um, immediately I figured, because of everything that the adoption agency had told me about my birth mother, that she was on a registry. And for people who give up children for adoptions, there's these, there are these things called registries where you definitely you kind of put your name out there and you um, say that if the person ever wants to find me, I'm willing to find them. So I immediately, so when I called up the first age registry I learned about and I called them, I knew immediately that they, that I would find my mother. So like I found my name on a Monday, I called the registry on a Tuesday, on a Thursday I was on the phone with my mother. And I remember hearing her voice the first time. There are people who do studies of children and you recognize your mother's voice in the womb. Like if somebody tape recorded your mother's voice and then like just moved it around a room and they did a, they did a sonogram of the baby, the baby's head would follow that voice in the way that it wouldn't follow other voices. So I remember the first time I heard my mother's voice. It was kind of oddly, oddly, oddly familiar. And the first time I saw her, I landed at an airport in Seattle, SeaTac Airport. It's a gigantic airport. Where I'm coming down the escalator, and there's like a thousand people in this room, and my eye just like, with computer accuracy, just narrowed the field to her in like, like seconds. I was like, Zoop. there she is. So I met her, and she told me about my father, and um, and my family in Kenya. So um, subsequently, I've been there. Um, it's very complicated. Uh, African culture is very rigid about the eldest male child in a family. So before I arrived, there was a presumed eldest male child in my family. So my arrival was not necessarily welcome. Um, also, out of wedlock children, there's a conservatism in the culture as well. So it was a complicating issue. But um, I have always been drawn to labor. My um, uncle is here, Tom Mboya, who was the founder of the Kenyan trade union movement, one of the founders. And um, he was uh, very close to the Kennedy family. The uh, other name that was associated with the, the airlift that brought Kenyan students over in the 1960s not, was not, not only Mboya, but, um, Mboya, but Obama. Uh, Barack Hussein Obama was one of the students that came over. Um, Wingari Mathai who went on to start the Greenbelt Movement, was one of the students who came over. So unfortunately, um, my 
uncle uh, ran afoul of, from what I understand, um, the uh, uh, political winds in, in Kenya and was assassinated. Some people say he was assassinated externally by foreign powers intervening. Um, the Kennedys very much wanted Kenya to be an American colony. Africa has been divided up by foreign powers and uh, colonial structure. Um, but my uncle uh, was assassinated, and this is a picture. And I have very, very few, well, I've seen photos. That I'm not sure who's who, but this is the only f known photo I have of my father. So he is the grieving gentleman. That was him grieving at the loss of his, his uncle. He passed away three years before I learned of his existence. He passed away in a car accident. The roads in Kenya are horrible. They're extraction routes. They're just, they, they, there's like a mine and a port. And the road just, however it needs to get there, gets there. No thought of congestion, no thought of safety, no thought of angle or pitch. Or, and the roads are subsequently in horrible shape. So he, he died in a car accident. Um, but I've been there. I've met some of several of my family members. And, um, uh, but it, it's funny. I thanked Gerald for the invitation here because as much as I like to talk about you know, my life and I reflect on my family, this has been tough talking about this. And I don't know if tough is the right word, but it's, um, it's been a process of learning about it and facing it and approaching it. And, and things I've kind of put aside and stalled because of, you know, life is already complicated. So adding complexity as you get older is something you don't always run towards. So you sometimes run away from it. And I think I've been running away from some things. But like this is probably more than I've looked at this face in preparing for this than I have in my whole life. Um, but, um, you know, it, 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 it's something that um, is, 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 uh, really, you know, appreciated doing this, this reflection, and, and I hope to, uh, you know, write about it. I mean, I, I, I'm, a te I'm teaching a memoir class, so I think I, <laughs> I, I, I have uh, a, a natural, um, you know, uh, uh, inclination to, to want to continue writing about my story. Um, but in honor of the person who invited me here to, to tell this story and to show you these slides, I'm going to read a poem. My mother likes to garden, turning soil, mocking graves, rise, raising living flowers from concrete beds. If war came in the springtime and evil landmines laid, mom would plant a garden, the minefield shade. In peacetime, she would harvest fragrant food and herbs, feeding more stray kittens, refugees from humans. I've grown a man feeding from her sustenance. My mother's like a garden, flowering magic strength. My father's house is a rock garden, ordered, weeded, clean. A house of brick and windows and always working machines. A beautiful rock garden on a hill above a river. He's such a giant gardener, he even tree trims the treetops. He catches poison ivy every time he goes to tend there yet he goes and gathers mint leaves long after his dogs have died. I think it's where he's fearless, in his garden, dogless, moving and arranging rocks, quietly planning his own plot. And who am I, you ask, as I ponder their love flowers? I am their true child, product not of seed but labor. The wind-scattered seed, the mountain-exposed children, the child in the manger, could not have had more luck. They made me like a garden, not a house plant or a pet, a wild field forest grown up nappy and unkempt. They didn't try to mow me or manicure my thinking. They walked through life among me, grew by my side and shade me, spread compost from the kitchen, made a path of love to guide me, and when they die, their flesh and bone will become my soil and root. Thank you.
questions? Well, we're in a college, so somebody can look this up, but I'm willing to bet that the voter participation in Australia far exceeds ours. Because um, public policy is, should be decided by a majority, and right now it's not. There's this thing about organizing that, that I learned in labor. A small, well-organized group can have disproportional influence. So what's happening is with, with, with spheres of extremes on either, either side of an issue, a small, well-organized group can have disproportional influence. So why do we have hundreds of millions of guns? There are more guns than people in this country. I think there are a couple guns for every person. And yet 97% of the public want gun control or some kind of enhanced gun control. So how do you explain that? Because there's a small group of people who are exerting disproportional influence. And the only way to remedy that is by mass participation. But we are so far away from that. Um, I also think it's ironic that it's adolescents now who are demonstrating how adolescent our democracy is. We are spoiled children as a nation. We're not an adult nation. We don't take adult responsibilities as a nation. <coughs> Some adult nations penalize people for not voting. You are fined in some countries. Or other nations make voting as easy as mailing in a postcard or you know, um, going to a movie. We, we kind of make it like as hard as it is to go to the DM, you know, the DMV. Um, in some places, they're going backwards. They're actually trying to with, with, withdraw the right to vote. In North Carolina recently, they used to have early voting in, 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 in states where the Sunday before the election, you could vote so that churches would organize buses. And somebody thought that was a bad idea. Now, who would think that's a bad idea? Somebody who's trying to exert disproportional influence. So the remedy of you know, bad policy is um, thoughtful people in large numbers exerting their influence. And, um, you know, it's, um, and also sunlight is the best disinfectant. So the fact that most people never read an article about a political or policy issue um, right now Television is an entertainment vehicle. The number of dollars that are spent on informing the public objectively about what's going on is so minute that most people are learning about the absurdity that people are complaining that it's a mental health issue and they just allowed a provision that would keep guns away from the mental, mentally ill, they allowed it to lapse intentionally, because they felt that it was an encroachment on the Second Amendment. So, you know, we um, are the people if we vote. If we don't vote, we are the cannon fodder. So, if you want to be a person and a citizen, you have that right. As I said, I started out saying that there was a man who it was against the law for him to read and write. And against those odds, he became a scholar. There were people who was against the law for them to vote. And they died trying to vote. They had their houses blown up. They had their children blown up in churches to vote. 
and we don't vote? Who have the right? Who haven't sacrificed? And it's, you know, it's speech now, and it's a thought, and it's abstract, but somebody coming through the door with an, you know, AK-47 is something that we have to discuss now regularly. I'm sure, have you guys had active shooter drills? He's going to be here? His name is Greg Gibson. He wrote a book called Gone Boy about his son. Yeah. He became a writer. He's a bookseller. He became a writer yeah. by writing that book. Um, the book is very well received. It's old now, but yeah. uh, I've been a good friend with Greg for about 15 years. So he's, before the shooting in Florida, I had already signed for yeah. him in, in the spring. And that's the kind of, whenever a shooting happens, you're always in touch anyway. Yeah. So if you're interested in this, or if you want to be motivated by what's been happening in Florida with the young people there, inspired by what I saw only, as I said, as you mentioned, with, in terms of what you were saying about getting involved, yeah. it seems like it's a good place as a college that seems like it's insulated, but we're all waiting for the next next shooting. Yeah. Well, well, the, the fear is... Co- the next target? I'm just saying it's, it's yeah. the next yeah. target. Well, it's anywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. It's random. It's like lightning strikes, but, um, well, not like lightning strikes. It's like the weather. It's like bad weather. It's like, wh- wh- you know, wh- where's, the, where's the next storm? But um, I worry about compassion fatigue because there's so much that happens and then the next thing happens and we become numb and, and then we become apathetic. So, um, This is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King, April 4th. Um, so, you know, if, if you want to read one thing by him that is instructive over what's going on, it's, um, it's the letter from Birmingham Jail. He talks about the four steps of direct action. It's a really good thing to do. I do it like in deciding things in my life, like major decisions. He says if you're going to get into a conflict with somebody about something, first of all, it has to be nonviolent. But the steps are the first thing you do is um, research to make sure that there is a real conflict, that, that something happens. So if somebody d- offends you, make sure you didn't mishear what they said, they didn't mean something else. And the next step is negotiation. You go to that person and say, hey, is there really a problem here? You know, can we manage this without really having a dispute? And then the third question is, the th- third step is purification. You ask yourself, am I coming from a good place? King was a Christian, so he would say, is this, in, is this consistent with the co- commandments? Am I being vain? Am I trying to you know, um, bully you? Am I, you know, um, jealous of you? Am I coming from a good place? And then the final step is direct action. And what he premise, the premise of that is that if you go through in life those four, three things, those steps before you act, you're going to have a good result. And the beauty of these students is that they're going through those steps so quickly. I mean... They, the first thing they did, you could tell they've researched if you heard any of them speak. They're, they're well-versed in the law, which is incredible for high school students. And then they are in a process now of um, negotiating. They're going to all of these elected officials and saying, do something, do something. And then hopefully they will clear their heads and make sure that they're going the right way because, um, you know, it, it, it's very, very um, incredible that... Uh, Emma Goldman was a woman who said, um, the revolution you make determines what comes after. So the, the, the power of Gandhian nonviolence is that if you're trying to make a civilization better, you don't use the tools that have caused such grief. So this would, whatever is the opposite of what you do when you're angry with a gun is the way you proceed um, in, in the Kingian view. So um, there was a lot of uh, information in my elongated improvisation. Um, question in the back.
but it's also hopeful. I have to tell you, some of the speeches that I've heard coming from young people, and, and they're getting nationally transmitted, so it's a, you know, there's a Chinese proverb, may you be cursed to live during interesting times. These times are starting to look more and more interesting. So, um, yes? Um, I mean, that's a question that, that millions, literally, of people are asking themselves right now. Um, I, I think that um, I, I had a conversation with Barry today about, I, I, I think, um, how it's hard to be an optimist in a world where there's so much pain and suffering. And, and, um, but I, I think it's an acceptance that... Um, you know, you, uh, you, I need to feel um, good about my, my life. And, and I need to know that I've done the right thing. And I need to remove my ego from it and realize that I am, you know, um, even Martin Luther King wasn't Martin Luther King. There were millions of Martin Luther Kings. We're, we're, we're products of our time. So with all these things are going on, we all have to just take a step forward. We all just have to take a step forward. And if everybody takes a step forward at the same time together, powerful things will happen. So you really can't focus on anything else but what your actions are and what you're willing to do. And, and you will affect the people around you if you all take a step forward at the same time. There's this dance in South Africa called the Toy Toy. So they get together at a demonstration and 10,000 10, people will... And they'll all stomp at the same time. And to hear 10,000 footsteps stomp at the same time would scare a herd of elephants away. Mm -hmm. So if everyone in their life just, like I see happening, just takes a step forward. Um, certainly some people are in the front. Some people are in the back. You know, not everybody is going to storm the Bastille and be at the gates with Robespierre. And I think that's what happens in the world. I think everybody wants to be Robespierre. Everybody wants to be Martin Luther King. Everybody wants to give that speech, have that sound bite, bite you know, be on the cover of Time magazine. I mean, we're actually being led by a person who's obsessed with being on the cover of every magazine. So don't worry about magazines. You know, well, just worry about magazines with bullets in them. You know, and just do the right thing in your life. Be committed to it. And um, that's all we can do. Thank you. Thank you.